Hello, and welcome to the Bradley Lectures Podcast. I'm your host, Jackson Wolford. In December, as we approach the end of the year, many in the United States are accustomed to devoting some special time to consider their relationship with their faith. Perhaps especially at the end of this particular year, many of us may also end up taking a moment to think of our families, our friends, and the sheer strangeness of this world. But there is a new year coming, and who knows? Maybe other worlds. Today we will hear a lecture entitled God and the Astronomers from Robert Jastrow, first chairman of NASA's Lunar Exploration Committee and founder and former director of NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies. While Dr. Jastrow passed in 2008, his suggestion that science and faith can hold productive dialogue remains vital today. With several potential COVID-19 vaccines in the works and Americans already discussing the morality of the vaccine and its delivery, it is a healthy thing to remember that both our most trusted principles of physics and our most firmly held beliefs in metaphysics always have something productive to say to one another. Please enjoy this lecture, delivered in 1992 at the American Enterprise Institute. I would like to say something before getting down to the specifics of the discoveries made at Mount Wilson, and primarily at Mount Wilson, actually. But first, I'd like to make a general comment on, on the worldview of the scientist. My colleagues have pieced together a remarkable story of chain of cause and effect that stretches from the beginning of the universe, the evidence for which I will describe in a moment, through the formation of the sun and the earth and across the threshold of life on earth and up the ladder of life to mankind. And it is a great success of the scientific method that they have been able to weave together this connected chain of events, although there are some mysteries associated with it and its implications that, again, we'll come to in a moment. But that success has given many scientists the philosophical outlook of a materialist and reductionist. It's a viewpoint that sees matter as the only reality, and the study of matter is the only path to the understanding of man and his nature. And there is no room in this way of thinking for forces that lie outside the world of matter and its interactions, and that includes what is generally called thought as well. So as a consequence, many scientists, I would say almost all, not, all, not entirely all, have either an atheistic or an agnostic outlook. They feel they have a firmer grip on reality than other seekers after the truth. However, there are reasons for believing that their confidence, while not necessarily at error, is premature. And I would like to talk to you a little bit about that. The uh, specifics that lead to these remarks are the following. Astronomers have joined theologians in a very interesting conclusion. Namely, they have discovered hard, concrete physical evidence that the universe had a beginning, that there was a moment in time prior to which none of the matter, the seeds that we know of as the beginnings of planets, stars, and life existed, and that in that abrupt moment, all of this came into being. The evidence that lies behind this conclusion was discovered by Hubble at the 100-inch telescope on Mount Wilson, and it consists in the finding that when the galaxies, these vast clusters of stars that populate the heavens, there, I, one can call them the nation states of the heavens with the stars as their individual citizens. When these galaxies are studied, it is revealed that they all are moving away from us and from one another at fantastic speeds ranging up to hundreds of millions of miles an hour. And the general picture of this outward movement is that of fragments of matter retreating from one another as if in the aftermath of a great explosion. Now, if you imagine this outward movement and now you reverse the direction of time, or run the movie strip in reverse, and go backward, if the galaxies are this far apart today, yesterday they were this far apart, or the day before that far apart. Going back far enough in time, you come to a moment, a very distinct moment or moments, in which all the matter in the universe is packed together into nearly infinite density, pressure, and temperature. And farther back than that in time, you cannot go, not in the material universe. That moment must have marked the beginning. Now again, reverse the direction of time and go forward instead of backward. And you see that in response to the pressures of this, this cosmic fireball, the elements of the universe will expand and retreat from one another. And gradually, as time passes and the temperature of the fireball diminishes, galaxies, stars, and planets condense. And on some of those planets, at least one we know of, life appears and the universe assumes the form it has today. Now, there are a couple of important remarks in this. First of all, the seed, the material seed, and I'm always careful to distinguish that from the, from the world of the spiritual, the material seed of every star, planet, and living thing in this cosmos owes its origin to that first moment. It was literally the moment of creation in a physical sense. A very theological result, by the way, because if you ask what cause led to this effect, we call the universe, the material universe, 
science cannot answer the question, owing to the circumstance that in the first moments after the Big Bang, the temperature, density, and pressure of matter were nearly infinite, and so any clues, any evidence that might be left over from the pre-Big Bang universe that would provide a clue to the physicists as to what caused this event, what forces conspired to bring it about, those clues are melted down and destroyed. It's as if nature dropped a curtain over the mystery of creation and said, you scientists have been very successful in, in penetrating the past. You can go this far back, but no farther. And this a-causal event is very distasteful to my colleagues. Einstein hated the idea, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a moment. Many of them disliked it. However, certain discoveries, most recently cemented in by a NASA satellite, provided evidence so convincing, so strong, so quantitative, that no one anymore can doubt that this was indeed the way it all started. Well, there's one fellow who doubts it, Fred Hoyle, who is retired, and he mutters away in the Midlands of, of England that uh, it could be this way or that, but no one pays much mind to him because most doubting Thomases now agree this is the way it was. By the way, the evidence, which again, I'll show you something of in my very last slide, the evidence that convinced the last of the doubters is that when the universe was first created, according to this picture, it was filled with a dense white heat of the cosmic fireball. Now, that radiation is still with us. It can't go anywhere because it filled the universe, and the universe is everything. There's no place for it to escape to. So a, a very brilliant physicist named George Gamow said, if we look for it, we should be able to find it, weakened by the passage of time, attenuated, but still there and discernible. In 1965, two fellows working for AT&T actually found it. They were looking for something else, of course, but they stumbled across the existence of the cosmic fireball radiation. And this just about convinced everyone. And then, in 1989, NASA put up a satellite, specially instrumented, to study the detailed properties of this fireball radiation. And they discovered, I mean, my colleagues discovered in this way, that the distribution of intensities with wavelength or frequency, the so-called spectrum of that radiation, exactly mimicked the theoretical calculations for the spectrum of the light and the heat produced in the cosmic explosion. And when that result came, and I'll show it to you because it's one of the most remarkable graphs ever obtained in the history of science, it quelled the last doubts, and we now live in a world in which we know that a certain amount of time in the past, the universe was in a dense, hot state, and it has evolved out of that state into the form we know today. Now, when did this happen? How old is the universe? If you know the distances apart of the galaxies and how fast they're retreating from one another, you can figure out on the back of an envelope when they all were together in one place, speaking loosely. And the answer turns out to be 15 billion years. There's a, a bitter, acrimonious struggle going on in cosmology as to whether it's 10 billion or 20 billion, but this is a detail from our point of view. So I've picked 15 billion as a good compromise, and we'll go with that, and 15 plus to take a few really doesn't matter. The important thing is it happened abruptly, suddenly, and without known cause. So 15 billion years is the age of the universe, and that's a very important number with implications for man's place in the cosmos that I'll come back to in the conclusion of these remarks. A second point is what caused the beginning of the universe. And I've already alluded to the fact that the scientists, to their dismay, cannot answer that question. They cannot find out, not now, but not next year in science times, and very likely never, what conspired to bring about this beginning. A very, very deistic result. If you are a professed agnostic as I am, you do not know the answer to the question. If you are a believer, you know what caused the beginning. In either case, it is a very remarkable finding. One side point, by the way, that's always puzzling. I mentioned that when the universe was very young, short time after the Big Bang, it was compressed to nearly infinite density, temperature, and pressure. Infinite compression sounds like the universe was compressed to a point. This is a very puzzling picture for the universe semantically, because the universe is the totality of all things in space and time. If it was compressed to a point, where is that point? And why is it there and not somewhere else? There's something peculiarly built in illogicality in that picture. The answer to this is that the science reporters who write on this stuff have misled people. The picture is wrong. The universe was not compressed to a point at the beginning. The part of the universe we can see today, the so-called observable universe, which is a sphere 30 billion light years in diameter, that was at an early time, well, perhaps this big, and at a still earlier time that big, and at a still earlier time that big. It may have been a point at the beginning. But the proper picture to have of the young universe is this is a horrible thing to do to this audience, I must ask you to stretch your imaginations to encompass a double infinity. Think of an infinite sea of matter, without limit, infinite in extent, to the horizon and beyond, no end. And now imagine that every point in that infinite sea of matter is infinitely dense. This is the picture you must have of the beginning of the universe. 
It is a universe that has no center and yet is infinitely dense. It is compressed to a point everywhere. I don't know whether I've helped or hindered. The last time I gave this explanation, it seemed to cause more trouble than, <laughs> more harm than before. Perhaps I can try to clarify that side point, but interesting one later. Let us leave aside the question of the beginning, the age of the universe, again to come back to it for a moment at the end and explore another implication in it. Let me come to another result, which is also very puzzling. According to scientific cosmology, in a number of ways, and it's almost difficult to enunciate this because it's so peculiar, it seems as though the circumstances of the universe and the very magnitudes of the forces of nature themselves have been fine-tuned to create a universe in which it is possible for life to emerge and evolve into an intelligent form, a conscious form. The slightest departure from what we know of as the constants of nature in the early universe or the universe today would have led to the evolution of a universe perfectly acceptable, describable by the physicist, except there could have been no physicist in it. It could not have held life. I'll give you one example out of perhaps a round dozen uh, that illustrate this peculiar circumstance. When the universe was young and expanding rapidly and it was very hot and no stars, galaxies, or planets or life had yet formed, the gases were very hot, the momentum of the outward expansion was counteracted by the inward pull of gravity, acting on all the elements of matter in the universe, tending to slow down the expansion and bring them together again. It so happens that there is a balance between the outward force of that initial momentum, the outward momentum, I should say, and the inward pull of gravity that just balances the universe on a knife edge in the following sense. If the outward momentum of the initial Big Bang, for which there is no law in physics to determine the magnitude, it is just a given by the deity or whomever, if the outward momentum of the initial Big Bang had been ever so slightly greater than it is, than it was at the beginning, by only a few parts per trillion, theoretical cosmologists tell us that the elements of matter in the universe would have flown apart too rapidly for galaxies, stars, planets, or life to appear. So the universe would have been a good physical universe, but without life. If, on the other hand, the outward momentum of the Big Bang had been initially a few parts per trillion smaller than it actually was, then the stars, galaxies, and planets would have formed, but the universe would have come to a halt in its expansion and fallen in on itself, converging into another replay of uh, infinite temperature and density in what is sometimes called the Big Crunch. This would have happened too quickly for stars, planets, or life to appear. In either case, the universe would have been without life. Why is it? How has it happened? What has been responsible for the fact that that outward momentum whose magnitude is not determined by any physical relationships or fundamental laws, just happened coincidentally to be such as to allow life to appear in this universe, and in no other case could that have occurred. And I won't take time, but I, for those who are curious, I can recite three or four or five other examples of this same peculiar quality in the universe, which has become enshrined by cosmologists as the anthropic principle. The principle that for reasons unknown to us, the universe seems to have been designed for life to emerge and mankind to inhabit. A very deistic result, even more deistic than the a-causal beginning of the universe itself. I have some thoughts on the anthropic principle that have convinced me that it is, in fact, an empty tautology, but not everyone agrees with me. Again, let me defer that to informal conversation later. Suffice it to say that many scientists, and of course those of a theological bent, even more so, are very impressed with the anthropic principle. Now I'd like to turn to a third point, which again relates to the interface, problems of the interface of science and religion. I think it is much more central to that body of thought, and that is the question of purpose. We don't know why it is that the universe seems to have been fine-tuned for life to appear and mankind to, to evolve. Be that as it may, once we cross the threshold of life, Darwin's ideas on natural selection, Pache, Dr. Crystal, who disagrees with me on this, but we can have at it later, Darwin's ideas on the evidence from the fossil record provide a fairly satisfactory account of the steps in nature by which mankind developed out of the lower forms of life. All the famous missing links that used to be missing no longer are. Every one of the big ones is there, and again, I can document that in an informal conversation later. So now we have a chain of events governed apparently by inanimate forces, natural selection, reproductive success, acting on randomly created variations in the, in the gene pool, which has led to a very remarkable picture that it appears that mankind, with our powers of intellect and spirit, has been formed from the dust of the earth by chance alone. A random succession of events stretching over billions of years 
in which gradually the laws of natural selection have evolved and caused the complex to be transformed out of the simple, always towards higher forms of life, more capable forms of life. And the question is, has that indeed happened through chance alone? George Gaylord Simpson, who is, well, he's now recently died, was the dean of American evolutionists, was confident of the answer. And most of my colleagues are confident of the answer. Simpson wrote that, now we see the point, he said, evolution achieves the aspects of purpose without a purposer, capital P, of a vast plan without a planner, again, capital P. Yet, as I mentioned, the history of life has a direction, from the simple to the complex, from the lower to the higher, and always towards greater intelligence in the last 250 million years. So can it be true that these events leading to mankind, with their clear direction, are yet entirely undirected? And I leave that question at this stage for the moment again. A little more, however, on the question of purpose. I mentioned that it seems as though blind chance, acting through the medium of random mutations in the gene pool, modulated by the forces of the environment, has led to the appearance of this extraordinary organism, the human brain, housed in an extraordinary entity, the human being. And the question is now, what is the meaning of this? Is it literally true, as would seem on the surface of it, that mankind and human existence are accidents in the cosmos, that no design or purpose guides the evolution of the universe, no larger plan of which we are a part? Darwin, it's very interesting, as some of you may know, started out with a very strong religious background in his family upbringing, but gradually lost his faith as he studied the fossil record, wrote in a letter to a friend in 1970, my theology is a simple muddle. I cannot look at the universe as a result of blind chance, yet I can see no evidence of beneficent design, or indeed a design of any kind, in the details. Now, modern biologists and evolutionists are less ambivalent than Darwin, and pretty certain they know the whole story. You can say that his credo, as I just read it, is that of the agnostic, which I share. But Jacques Monod, who won a Nobel Prize in chemistry for unlocking some of the mysteries to the keys of genetic replication, wrote some years ago, chance, he said, now we see, chance alone is at the source of all creation. Pure chance, absolutely free but blind, is at the very root of the tremendous edifice of evolution. This central concept, Monod wrote, is no longer one among other conceivable hypotheses. It is today the sole conceivable hypothesis. This, by the way, I think one can say, with due respect to his biochemical competence, is a misreading of the theory of natural selection. Because natural selection says that pure blind chance creates the ingredients of evolution, those mutations, those variations in the, in the population. But those variations are then acted on by an external force, the pressure of the environment which modulates the evolution of new forms of life and guides these random variations as inexorably as the pressure applied to the atoms in a pipe guides the flow of a gas through the pipe. I think in conclusion, by the way, one can say that, that in fact, what Darwin discovered is that the forces of, of the environment are transmitted through the mechanism of reproductive success or natural selection to the forms of life, mold those forms of life as inexorably as gravity molds the stars and planets. But again, we must ask, Granted that that's true in a detailed mechanistic sense, so it seems to be true, can this be the whole story? Because here we have, on the one hand, inanimate matter, on the other hand, the human being, an extraordinary entity, and, and we just wonder whether we have, there's more to be said. Arthur Peacock, who's a biochemist and also a theologian, dean of Clark College in Cambridge, puts the matter very nicely. He says, what kind of universe can this be in which the primordial concourse of hydrogen atoms manifests the potentiality of becoming man. And to this question of plan, purpose, transcendent force, as to the questions of beginning and also of end in the universe, science has no answer. The scientist says, now I'm not quoting Peacock anymore, but making a comment. The scientist says, if I know the story, as my own personal studies in my career have yielded it to me and as other, for others as well, if I know that story with its chain of events and an explanation, a physical explanation at every link in that chain, I need no more. There is no need for me to introduce the existence of the deity or an overwhelming transcendent force or purpose. And so, therefore, I say by Occam's razor, there is no more. Now, many out find this outlook to be less than satisfactory. I remain an agnostic. I simply don't know what conclusion to come to in this matter. I can see arguments on either side. A final comment, very interesting implication by way of concluding in the cosmological discoveries, coming full circle now back to the beginning, I mentioned a number early in these remarks, 15 billion years. That is the age of the universe, give or take a few billion, but
but an abrupt beginning. Now contrast that with another number yielded by the study of the moon rocks and meteorites. 4.64 billion years, give or take a few hundred million, the age of the solar system, the sun, and the earth. These two numbers tell us something that philosophy, and I would say theology, cannot yield regarding mankind's apparent place in the cosmic order. They tell us that we are recent arrivals, that if there is life elsewhere, that life is, on the average, billions of years more evolved and possibly more advanced than we are. How much more, by the way? The age of the solar systems in the universe, and we have good indirect evidence that there are countless billions of them, including many Earth-like planets, the age of those solar systems is about 15 billion years. Well, take a billion years off at the beginning because initially the elements of which life and Earth-like planets are made were not present in great abundance. They were made in stars and sprayed out later. So let's say 14 billion years. The average age, therefore, of the planets, the Earth-like planets in the universe is half of 14 or 7 billion years. 7 billion years is 2.5 billion years longer than the age of the Earth. What forms of life existed on the Earth 2.5 billion years ago? What does 2.5 billion years mean in the history of evolution? The answer is that the highest forms of life on the Earth 2.5 billion years ago were one-celled plants and animals, bacteria and algae. What does a billion years mean in evolution? A billion years ago, the highest forms of life on the Earth were invertebrates, worms and jellyfish. You ask, therefore, how do the attainments of mankind stand in relation to those of our brothers and sisters elsewhere in the universe who have been born on planets that came into being earlier than we? And the answer is, if they are a billion years older than we are, and if one reads the history of the Tree of Life, as I and others read it, as one of continuing progression, they are a billion years beyond us, and we are to them as the worms in our gardens are to us, which is a very humbling and to many people irritating view of the achievements of mankind. It tells us that while we stand at the summit of creation on this planet, in the cosmic order, our position is very humble indeed. Well, maybe so and maybe not. I personally think that that is, in fact, the way it must be on the inferential evidence I've given to you. It would be awfully interesting to find out. And the way to find out, of course, is to make contact with those who have traveled along the path that we are traveling, but have traversed it a billion years ago. And they have now perhaps reached that ultimate state that we can look forward to. And if we can meet up with them, we will learn our future and know its face and form. How can we do that? Well, we can get in a rocket ship and go out there. But unfortunately, the nearest star similar to the sun that's likely to have planets is Alpha Centauri. It's 25 trillion miles away. It takes 100,000 years to get there at fast rocket speeds. A little better to do it by radio. Then a, a round-trip conversation would be punctuated by an eight-year round trip, and that's not intolerable. In fact, if you look at the stars around us within a dozen light years of the Earth, there are about 40 stars similar to the sun within a dozen light years, but two of them are similar to the sun, old enough to have intelligent life on them, according to our reading of evolution on this planet, and therefore a likely prospects for life if it is common in the universe. Their names are Tau Ceti and Alpha Centauri. A dozen light years in distance is very interesting. If you contemplate the fact that around the mid-1960s, television really got going, network television at high power, the million-watt level. So since about 1965, the old Tonight shows and the I Love Lucy shows have been spreading out into the universe, telling those folks that intelligent life exists on this planet. And uh, if you say in 1965 plus 12 years to get out to Tau Ceti, 1977, 12 years to get back, 1989, we should have been hearing from those folks. Well, we haven't been listening up to now. One of the reasons is that when NASA first introduced the idea of trying to listen, and it's not easy, by the way, because you don't know what channel they're broadcasting on if they are doing that, so you have to sweep a lot of channels simultaneously, and NASA wanted to build a receiver that would sweep 8 or 10 million channels at once. So Proxmire got this uh, budget request. The first thing he did was to give him the Golden Fleece Award. The second thing he said was, I've been trying for years to find intelligent life in Washington, and I'm damned if I'm going to spend a nickel of the taxpayers' money on looking for it in space. Fortunately, the senator retired, and NASA went ahead. Their appropriation for listening was knocked out again this year in all the budget consciousness, but they decided to spend a little bit of their own money. So it was our money, but money they took from another program. And on October 12th, just a month ago, they started to listen finally at 8 million channels at one time with very big dishes. And since radio astronomers on these nearby stars now know from our television signals that we are here. And I should think if they lived a billion years longer than us, they must be pretty jaded 
and very interested in sampling some new experiences and finding out where funny folk live here. It's quite possible that they are replying, and I would say if you don't smoke too much, you will live to see it happen in your own lifetime. What the consequences will be I, are difficult to say, and, and that's a fruitful subject for another talk, another time, and another place. Another talk, another time, another place. On that optimistic note, we'll close out this year and hope that the next one is physically and metaphysically, perhaps a slight improvement over the last. Thank you all for listening, and we hope you'll join us next time on the Bradley Lecture Podcast.